Thanks there, Tom. Yeah, my time comes. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> does. We'll clap loudly when the time comes. <laughs> so um, I'm going to skip the local intro stuff that I usually do then uh, with Sunday Mass. And uh, all i got to do is I'm going to close this door, close that door. Um, and we're all ready. Yeah, hey, we've got – we still got anything in here. Well, good evening and welcome to UW Space Place. Thanks for joining us for tonight's um, Tuesday night guest speaker. And uh, tonight we have John Rummel, who's a, a well-known figure in the Madison uh, astronomical community. John is a former president of the Madison Astronomical Society and most recently has been very involved in uh, dark sky uh, measures in, um, well, actually, Don, John's done, I meant to mention John's done a lot of work in uh, exploring dark sky sites around both Wisconsin and the, and the nation uh, and uh, knows how to pick the good ones. But he's been talking about um, recently working on how to uh, improve lighting conditions, urban lighting conditions, especially in Madison. And um, so tonight he's going to uh, talk to us about uh, Madison's uh, efforts in the direction of becoming a dark sky community. So, John, thanks. Thank you, Jim. So, uh, I do want to introduce tonight the concept of uh, light pollution, dark skies, and that kind of stuff, but I want to talk specifically about Madison. So, I'm going to start with um, a couple of pictures. I have pictures of Madison in the area scattered throughout the presentation. So, I'll just say a few short words about some specific examples of lights Check, test, one, two. Testing, check. Check, check, check. One, two, three. Four, five, six. Yes. Sorry if you're listening right now. I've got the audio live, but we're having a little bit of an audio uh, problem, which I'm working on. So just stand by here for a second. Four minutes. There we are. Okay. I think we're. Push it back. Not there. 
Testing, testing. I think we're good now. Okay. Sorry, John. Go do you want me to go back or do you want me to just, just start over, I guess, or wherever you want? Well, I, uh, I'm going to show you a few pictures along the way tonight of some, some Madison local scenes. And um, this is one. This is Hilldale um, Theaters, uh, Sundance Theaters, although I don't, I think it's AMC now. I, I'm not sure if they've changed hands. But I, I took this picture a couple of months ago, and I, I like this one because this is an example of some reasonably good lighting in the Madison area. Madison does do some, some things well. And you can see along the uh, upper border there, there are recessed lights that are shining straight down, illuminating that walkway on those two sides of the building. Now, there are parking lot lights uh, on poles, you know, separate from that. But if it wasn't for those parking lot lights, if you disregard those lights, that's a great example of a well-lit pathway using fully shielded downward facing lights. Those are, uh, those, are, those are really, really good lights, really, really smart lighting. So Madison does have some things. Uh, Madison has taken some steps in the past few years to really enact some good lighting practices. And I'll point out some of the good ones and some of the bad ones as we go tonight. But here's what we're gonna do tonight. These are the objectives. What I want to do is I want to cover a general introduction to light pollution. So if you've never really heard a talk on what light pollution is, we're going to cover that in the first half. We're going to take a specific look at Madison. What is Madison doing? What are Madison lighting conditions like? How bad is Madison's light pollution? We're going to um, talk about the International Dark Sky Association, IDA's uh, Dark Sky Community Program. And finally, we're going to ask the question, could Madison be a dark sky community? And there's a really good reason to ask that question right now because the Madison City Council has taken some steps recently that I'll get into later. Here's another example of a local Madison building. And most of my examples are from the west side of Madison because I live on the west side of Madison. This is on Mineral Point Road by the CUNA complex near the intersection of Whitney Way, uh, Rosa Road and, and Mineral Point. This is a new building that was just erected in the past year and a half or so. And the interesting thing is, is that thing that sticks out on the side. What is that? Um, and obviously a nighttime shot, that protuberance, protuberance is well lit, very artistically lit. And it turns out that is the auditorium inside this new CUNA building. And that external lighting is, is a feature. They, they designed that. And I talked to the facilities manager of this building. I showed him this picture, and of course he knew what I was talking about because this is, this is his project. And he says that those lights are equipped with dimmers. And the dimmers haven't been activated yet, but the plan is along the way, they're gonna tune the brightness of those lights at night so that the artistic feature of the building is still, is still defined, but they can dim the, those lights down a little bit. And by the way, the guy that I talked to was really unhappy about those first floor lights that had been left on at about 10 o'clock at night, which is when this picture was taken. So uh, another example of a privately funded uh, commercial building in Madison where people are paying attention to their external lights. They did a study actually with the Audubon Society to see if this would have any impact on bird behavior. Would dead birds be found around the base of the building? And, and Audubon Society co cooperated with an eight week study. So people are doing good things in Madison. What is light pollution? So the light pollution definition that I use is the one that the IDA defines. Light pollution is any adverse impact or uh, impact attributable to the use of artificial light at night. And that's the definition that most people use these days. Even in the scientific literature where people study light pollution, that's the definition that they generally use. What is light pollution? Uh, here are four examples. Uh, light trespass, overlighting, light clutter, and glare. And each one of those examples um, is something that you can just walk around your neighborhood or walk around the city of Madison. You can find examples of light trespass. When a light erected for a specific purpose spills over into an area where it's not needed or not desired. And the classic example is the street light that shines in your bedroom window all night long. That's light trespass. And then like cluttered, overlighting, glare, and so forth. Here's another example from near my house. This is also Mineral Point Road. This is the um, affiliated uh, physician's building near the intersection of Grand Canyon. And I put this one up because 
First of all, there are floodlights on that lawn on top of the hill shining on the building as though the, um, the manager of the building doesn't want us to miss the fact that there is a building there even at night. And so those floodlights, of course, are shining up at the building, which means a lot of the light is shining up at the sky too. But the reason that I put this there is because of the American flag. Uh, several of those spotlights or floodlights are, are tuned directly to the flag. And this is a terribly inefficient use of light because those floodlights cast a beam that's at least probably 60 to 70 degrees wide and a very tiny percentage of that light actually falls on the flag and lights it up. Most of the light is spilled needlessly and wastefully up into the sky. But as it turns out, there is a federal law that mandates the lighting of the American flag. Most flags are raised at dawn and, brought and, and, and lowered at dusk. But if you leave a flag flying all night and the United States code recognizes that some businesses and whatever don't have the manpower to go out and lower the flag every night, if you fly the flag 24 hours a day, it has to be lit per the United States code. And that's why we have lights like this. There are better ways to light the flag. There are inventions specifically that fit on top of flagpoles to light flags from above so that the light shines down. Flagpole waste is um, a very common example. What causes light pollution? Artificial light at night is what causes light pollution. And when they use the term artificial light at night, they do use the initialism Allen, or, or the acronym, I guess, Allen, to, to, um, to shorten that. Um, Allen, artificial light at night, also includes a lot of examples of indoor lighting that we're not going to talk about. The biggest one being the screens. We look at so many screens, we get exposed to so much blue spectrum light from computer screens and phone screens and, and television screens. That's also an issue, but that's not what we're talking. When we talk about artificial light at night, tonight we're specifically talking about outdoor artificial lighting. It's another example of outdoor lighting. This is the Owen Conservancy Park on Old Sock Road, I want to say, uh, right by where um, Crestwood School is on the west side. And this is a great park, Madison City Park, with the word conservancy in its name, Owen Conservancy Park. And in the parking lot, that light is a three-headed LED fixture. Two of the LED heads are pointed down. They're, they're full cutoff, so the light just shines down. But the third LED fixture is tilted about 40 degrees up because what they're trying to do is they're trying to illuminate that entire parking lot with a single pole. So they have three lights on top of that pole. And as you can see, this is fairly short exposure. Um, this is like a, an atomic bomb going off in this parking lot. Way, way more light than they need. And I, um, I have some contacts in the Madison Parks Department. So I called and emailed and, you know, raised the question. And um, the person that I ended up talking to said, well, the park closes at 10 p.m. What are you doing there anyway at night? You're not supposed to be there. And I just turned the around and said, yep, the park closes at 10 p.m. Why do we need this level of light when the park is closed? And notwithstanding the fact that we all know that people do go to the park at night because some people like to look at the stars or some people like to watch nocturnal animals and so forth and so on. So I, I'm confident Madison Parks will eventually do something about this. But once you paid for the pole and paid for the lights and had the people put the lights up, it's, it's difficult to undo something like that, which is why we practice preventative medicine as much as possible. What do we know about light pollution? Uh, and I didn't make up these numbers. These numbers are from research. 80% of the world lives under light polluted skies. 80% of the population of the world, we should say. The Milky Way is hidden from approximately one third of the people on Earth. Um, and 88% of Europe and 50% of the US never experienced true night. They experienced perpetual twilight because of our artificial lights. That means 88% of Europeans and 50% of Americans never experience a truly dark sky. They never see the stars as you see them from a pristine remote place. 
Uh, many of them have never seen the Milky Way. And that, that research comes from, I've got the citation there, I'll share the article with you later, Fauci. Not Fauci, that's a different scientist who's been in the news recently. Uh, but uh, that's, that, those are numbers that come from a, um, you know, a real study. It's not just a local problem. It's not just a U.S. problem. It's a global problem. And this is one of the global maps where they, they map out the light pollution problem uh, over the, the entire you know, span of the continents. And you can see that it's largely a European and North American problem, but it stretches to other areas as well. Um, going into, uh, we'll go into some detail in that map later, but another example from, from local, from my drivings around, the Forest Products Laboratory near the university along Campus Drive. And I took this picture because uh, the Forest Products Laboratory parking lot has those big spotlights that are on the edge of the building. And again, just big, probably some kind of halogen bulb shining directly out into the parking lot. But because of the angle of the lights, you know, much of that light is still. And I didn't notice it at the time. Oh, there it is. I didn't notice it at the time. But uh, when I was looking at the photo, I noticed that they also have a floodlight shining up so that they, they have the name Forest Products Laboratory uh, highlighted on the side of the building. And again, a spotlight pointed up doesn't do what it was intended to do because only a small percentage of that light shows the name of the building. Most of that light is spilled needlessly up into the sky. Why is this happening? This happens because we overuse lights relative to what our legitimate needs are. Why do we do that? Much of that overuse is just simple wastefulness. Um, and, and much of the wastefulness beca is because we're just not aware. As a culture, we're not aware. We equate light with safety and we equate light with society and civilization. And so we want places to be lit. Um, I'll come back to the matter of safety in a little bit, but uh, it, it's, it's something that happens because we don't pay enough attention to it. And it's a shame. Why does it matter? It impacts a lot of areas. It impacts traffic safety. It impacts energy security and climate. Um, it impacts crime. And finally, it has major impacts with respect to wildlife. And notice that I didn't list astronomy in that list because astronomy is really a very niche market. Not that many people are that concerned with stargazing, but a lot of people worry about crime. A lot of people worry about the impact on wildlife. So there's a lot more benefit to framing the question in terms of things that people care about. And by the way, when we talk about energy security and climate change, um, you know, we remind people that every watt of lighting that we use costs money. And when you consider the amount of those watts that are just completely wasted, that just translates directly into dollars wasted. We could save a lot of money by being smarter about the way we light things. This is a picture that wasn't taken in Madison. I took this one at a campsite in California, um, but I throw this up there just to highlight the work of the International Dark Sky Association. If you ever want to make a difference in, in the efforts to reduce light pollution, joining the IDA is the single best thing that you can do. This is a group that over the past um, almost three and a half, almost four decades since they've been uh, an organization has done more around this issue worldwide than anybody else. Recently, IDA, has coalesced a lot of its message down to the, what they call the five principles of smart lighting, or the five principles for responsible outdoor lighting. And these are really easy to remember points. The single word, light should be useful. So we should only use it if it's really needed. Light should be targeted. We should direct light where we need it. And that includes using fixtures that are full cutoff so that light doesn't wastefully shine up into the sky when we don't need it up in the sky. Light should be no brighter than necessary. We should pay attention to the level. We should control it. That means putting timers or motion control detectors on our lights. 
And then we should pay attention to the color of the light and use warmer lights. More oranges and yellows, less blues would be uh, very, very um, effective in mitigating effects on wildlife and effects on humans too. So I'm gonna switch directions now and I'm gonna talk about the International Dark Sky Communities. This is a program of the IDA. They do it in concert with the Illumination Lighting Engineering Society too, but primarily um, it's the IDA that, that, that runs this group. So there is such a thing as a community being able to apply for and gain status as an international dark sky community. But that's not the only one. There are also international dark sky parks, dark sky reserves, urban night sky places, and dark sky sanctuaries. So I just wanna say a word about those other four before we come back to communities. Dark sky parks is probably the one that most of you are familiar with because that includes a lot of national and state parks that can apply for the status and become an international dark sky park. The example that I used up here is Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado, very popular dark sky destination. In addition to the petroglyphs and ancient dwellings, they've got beautifully dark skies. But I could have also stayed closer to home and I could have used the example of Newport State Park right here in Wisconsin, up in Door County, International Dark Sky Park right here in Wisconsin, Newport. We have another uh, dark, sky, dark sky park that is in the process of development uh, out at Kickapoo in western, southwestern Wisconsin. But uh, dark sky parks are very popular. Many national parks and state parks in the US and worldwide have applied for and attained this status. And when they have this status, if you go to their website or if you visit the park itself, they trumpet their status. They're very proud of their status uh, doing their part to preserve dark skies. It's easy when you're a national park or a state park because you're probably already kind of out in the middle of nowhere and it's not a very big stretch to get that dark sky status. You just have to demonstrate that you're paying attention to how you use light at night. Dark sky reserves, dark zone, core, core dark zone areas surrounded by a populated periphery. Uh, the example that I use here is the Greater Big Bend International Dark Sky Reserve. If you know where Big Bend National Park is in West Texas, this is not the national park. This is the Greater Big Bend area that encomp encompasses a huge area of Southwest Texas around the Big Bend. It also incorporates the, um, the uh, Fort Davis area where the McDonald Observatory is, University of Texas Observatory, and a lot of uh, Mexico. It's truly an international area. But that's a very remote area, a very dark area, a very fragile area um, uh, ecologically, and it's protected in terms of its dark skies too, greater Big Bend area. Urban night sky places is probably the hardest one to explain, but I think the urban night sky places, which the definition, sites surrounded by large urban environs that actively promote an authentic nighttime experience. This was a nod to the fact that there are some places in the US that just aren't remote. They're never gonna be as dark as Mesa Verde or Big Bend. Um, and I, I, I wanted to throw an example up here. So there's an example called um, Fry Family Park near Canton, Ohio, Northeastern Ohio. So here is Northeastern Ohio on a dark sky map. The big blob up above is Cleveland, then Akron, and then Canton below. And the color coding on the map is the light levels. White is really, really bad. Dense, urban, opaque light pollution. So you can see the Canton down below is a smaller, you know, light polluted area than Cleveland is, but it's still significantly light polluted. The little pin at the bottom is where Fry Family Park is. It's only about 20 miles south of Canton. It's not really dark by dark sky standards. It's still a relatively light polluted sky, but Fry Family Park is working the problem. They are limiting their use of lights. They have ordinances and codes for the way light can be used within the park because they're trying to preserve that dark sky environment for the people who live in Canton and Akron and Cleveland so they can go someplace and enjoy relatively dark skies without having to worry that they're gonna be decimated by development in the next 15 or 20 years. So Fry Family Park is an example of an urban night sky place, officially designated. There are many of these and many of them are in places in the United States that most people don't associate with dark skies, 
but they're people making a genuine effort to preserve that experience in places where it's most at risk. Finally, dark sky sanctuaries. These are the most remote places in the world where conservation is the most at risk. And the example that I used is the Boundary Waters Canoe Area right up in northern Minnesota. Huge area in terms of square mileage, um, protected for its wildlife and its access to um, pristine waters uh, for canoeing, camping, fishing, and, and that kind of thing. But that entire area is an international dark sky sanctuary, providing it with even more ecological protection than it would otherwise get. But I want to come back to international dark sky communities, because that's where we really want to talk about that and bring the conversation back to Madison. So the definition of a dark sky community is an IDA international dark sky community is a town, city, or municipal municipality or other legal, legally organized community that has shown exceptional dedication to the preservation of the night sky through the implementation and enforcement of quality outdoor lighting ordinances, dark sky education, and citizen support of dark skies. Dark sky communities excel in their efforts to promote responsible lighting and dark sky stewardship and set good examples for surrounding communities. That's a really well-written definition. That definition, every single word is, is important. That's what a dark sky community is. In the US, we have 26 dark sky communities, so designated and approved by the IDA. 26, and I have them listed here in descending order of population. The most populous one is Flagstaff, Arizona. And if you know anything about Flagstaff and its history, that's not too surprising. Flagstaff has protected its night skies for years, largely because of astronomy tourism, home of the Lowell Observatory, and uh, a, a lot of, it's, it's just a, a forested wild area in northern Arizona, but it's, it's a beautiful area. Flagstaff has been doing this since before there was an IDA and, and long before the dark sky communities thing existed, making an effort to control the use of outdoor lighting at night to keep the city from becoming so light polluted that the Lowell Observatory could no longer do research. So Flagstaff has a population of 76,000. It's a fairly small town. Look at the population as that, ma as that list goes on. These are small communities. Have you ever heard of Homer Glen or Hawthorne Woods, Illinois? I hadn't either. Um, population 24,000 for Homer Glen and about 9,000 for Hawthorne Woods. Well, here they are. This is Chicago. Hawthorne Woods is the one, the pin at the top and Homer Glen is the pin there in the middle at the bottom, respectively uh, about 25 to 26 miles from downtown Chicago as the crow flies. Nobody in their right mind would describe anything on this map as dark because the light glow from the Chicago metropolitan area is overwhelming. You can see it from southern Wisconsin. Um, how in the world are these dark sky communities? So I, I'm going to overlay the dark sky color coding there so you can see what a mess Chicago is. And as you go out from Chicago, you go into the reds and the oranges, which means they're still light polluted, but they're less light polluted. And notice that both Homer Glen and Hawthorne Woods are in that orange red you know, area. So they are um, communities that have applied for and demonstrated a commitment to managing their use of light on their small local scale. And you see that little isthmus of orange that comes up in the bottom there. I don't know if Homer Glenn's efforts are responsible for that less light polluted little region in the middle of Chicago's light polluted area, but I like to think that maybe Homer Glenn had something to do with that. So these, these dark sky um, communities aren't necessarily remote and radically dark. They are communities that have recognized the value of dark skies and made a commitment through uh, official channels enacting codes and ordinances to make sure that the lighting that they use is smart lighting.
So I love the fact that Homer Glenn and Hawthorne Woods are just down the road from us. Um, this is, by the way, the color coding that's used on the map. Uh, the white square at the bottom, I call, these are my labels. I call it opaque urban skies. That's as bad as it gets. Chicago, Manhattan, the LA area, um, any really large city. You can barely see the brightest stars in the sky. And then as you go up that map, you see that, that Madison would be in the, the, the reds or the oranges. Uh, the middle, the yellows would be typical suburban skies. And when you get up to the blues, you're starting to talk about really, really dark places. Um, of the 26 cities listed here, fully two thirds of them have a population of under 5,000 people. And uh, three quarters of them have populations under 10,000. So when you think about communities that apply for and get this dark sky community status, overwhelmingly they are smaller communities. So go back to the definition. Yeah, I can see how Flagstaff could do that. I can see how even Homer Glenn, you know, might be able to do that. Could Madison do this? Could Madison be a dark sky community? According to the 2020 census, Madison has a population of 270,000. That's the city of Madison. If you go out to the county, uh, the broader metropolitan area of Madison, some people say it gets as high as 600 to 800,000 people packed into that area. Call it Dane County. That's a lot of people. Flagstaff was just 76,000. Could Madison be a dark sky community? Well, um, I have significant you know, questions about whether this could happen. Let's just take a quick look at the broader area. This is a Google Maps view of the state of Wisconsin and surrounding areas. There are the cities for your, so you can orient yourself. So we're looking all the way out into a lot of Iowa and a lot of, mini, or a lot of Minnesota, a little bit of Illinois. This is the dark sky overlay. So keeping in mind that coding where white is the worst. So you can see Minneapolis up above, um, Des Moines below, Chicago over to the right, and uh, Milwaukee. And you can probably pick out where Madison is. I'll put the labels back up to help you. And remember the blue coding on that map. Blue is where you really start to get the green and the blue. It's starting to get really dark, really rural. And you can see that not too far west of Madison, we got a lot of green. And we even have some, some of the blue and the purple out there. So we've got some pretty dark areas within reasonable driving distance of the Madison area. But Madison itself is, um, is kind of a big red blob in there. Color coding one more time just so that you can see that, that rural suburban transition, those greens and the, um, the blues. By the way, those greens and blues, those areas are what most of us consider to be really dark skies. We live in Madison. We live in a light polluted area. When we find skies that are in the green and the blue coated areas, that's what really seems dark to us because it's a relative thing. When you live in Madison and you go a couple of levels up that chart, it really seems dark. Most people have never been to the dark blue and the black. Most people have never seen a radically dark sky. Those are the kind of skies that I look for that Jim was referring to when he introduced me. I've done a lot of traveling out to areas where you, you get those radical skies. Zoom in on Madison. This, is the, um, this isn't the county. This is just kind of an expanded look at the area of Madison. And here is the overlay showing the light pollution levels as of 2006. So this data was from 2006. So quite a few years ago. And you can see that Madison is firmly in that kind of dark orange or reddish tone, meaning fairly, uh, you know, kind of an urban light polluted area. And as you go out from Madison, you go to the oranges and then to the yellows and then to kind of a intermediate yellow shade and then to the greens. So as you go out into Dane County, you do reach darker skies. But I put this map up here to compare with the next one, because this is 2006. This is what happened to it by 2020. Here's 2020 data. And I'm just going to click back and forth a couple of times so you can see how the colors have expanded. From 2006, Madison was a uh, kind of a uh, not quite as vivid shade of red. 
2020, whoops, 2020, Madison is now bright red, and that intermediate shade of red has expanded all the way down into Fitchburg and up into Wanakee. And look at how the other colors expand between 2006 and 2020. What's happening is development is happening. Building is happening. And, and, and increases in population. So people move in, people build houses, uh, people build businesses to support all that population. And everything that people build comes with new lights, more lights. And uh, part of this is also due to the, um, the LED revolution, what's called the LED. It's, it's almost like a, um, a kickback effect or a, 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 a reinforcement. LED lights are much, much cheaper. Um, I should I qualify, they're, they're cheaper in terms of electric use. Uh, uh, an old 100 watt bulb, an incandescent 100 watt bulb, can be duplicated, the light levels can be duplicated by an LED light that uses about 10 watts of electricity. So they're much more power efficient, they use less electricity. Initially they were expensive to buy, but the prices have come way down in the last several years. So LED lights are very cost effective to use and they're very cost effective over the long term in electrical usage. Rather than decrease our light levels, LEDs have a, had kind of a paradoxical effect because now that they're much cheaper, people say, well, I can afford many more lights. I can put up 10 lights now. And, and so people end up using more light than they need, going back to the wastefulness you know, to idea. But there's hope there. So, so this is the 2020 data. And just to throw that chart back up there to remind you that um, you know, those reds are as bad as it gets in Madison. But note, on the 2020 map, for the very first time, see that? A little smudge of white on the isthmus? That's the first time that we have seen that hint. Now, this is just a data-driven map. This is an actual satellite imagery or anything. I don't know what it is about that southwest corner of the isthmus. But the, the map that this, the data that this map is based on indicates that Madison for the first time is experiencing that downtown Milwaukee, downtown Chicago light bloom that is that opaque urban skies. Um, here's a blow up. I don't know what it is about that specific area of the isthmus, about four or five blocks southwest of Capitol Square, but that's what the map shows. And so that's just an indication that this is where we're headed. And I shudder to think that in 10 to 15 years, if this data is renewed, that Madison is just going to be another big white blob, just like Milwaukee, or just like you know Chicago on a smaller scale. But that's where we're headed. I took a picture of that area. That's, that's the very area of the isthmus that we're talking about from a park across the lake when I was uh, the comet of 2020, um, Neowise to get the comet above the isthmus. But that's the area, and that's just, you know, that's just downtown Madison with the Capitol overexposed. Uh, we like to light the Capitol because it's pretty to look at, but again, those are spotlights that are just shining up at the sky. And a picture like this really shows how much of that light is just spilling up into the sky. So I told you all of that, all of that to tell you this. The International Dark Sky Association's um, Dark Sky Community program has an application process. These are the program guidelines. I downloaded these directly from the IDA website. There's the link where they are, but everybody just Google searches these days. You can find these guidelines. The guidelines contain the um, minimal requirements. So if you wanted to be a dark sky community, if you were the Madison Common Council and you wanted Madison to become a dark sky community, you would need to know what the minimum requirements are. So I came to show you, it's five pages of fairly dense text, and this is just the application. This is just the minimum that you would need to demonstrate so that you can apply to be a dark sky community. So I'm just gonna show you some highlights of this. Page one, you have to have a quality, comprehensive lighting policy like the IDA, IES is the, um, it's the uh, Illuminating Engineering Society. Uh, they have a model ordinance. So you have to have a comprehensive lighting policy like that model ordinance that includes the following. Minimum standards, full shielding of all fixtures over 1,000 initial lamp lumens, 
uh, limit on the emission of short wavelength light through one of the following restrictions. And then it goes to A, B, subhead, number one. It just goes on and on and on for the requirements. And I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing, but I want to highlight just a few things. On the second page, um, they talk about restrictions on the amount of unshielded lighting, policies to address overlighting, regulations of new buildings, new constructions. Um, F is the restrictions on the installation and operation of signs. Signs are a huge offender. Think of those billboards along the highway that have the big arc lights at the bottom shining up on the billboards. And again, just such a terrible waste of light. So this minimum requ requirements goes on for five pages of stuff like this. It is amazing, the detail. And this isn't to be an IDA dark sky community. This is what you need to do just to submit an application. You have to show that your community is committed by having these things in place. There's a lot of hedging. There's a lot of within five years and, and, and you know things like that. But this is a significant commitment to um, dark sky planning. Number six there, a sky brightness measurement program. Um, the final one talks about community buy-in. The com community must erect and maintain appropriate signage, so forth and so on. This is a really ambitious thing to do. And you can see why not many cities are willing to do this, because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of regulation. This is from the city of Madison Common Council. And I know it's difficult to read this, but this has a date up in the upper right-hand corner of March of 2022. Um, Two common council members, two alders, uh, Grant Foster and Tag Evers, Tag Evers, uh, did this. And um, it's bureaucrat, you know, bureaucratic language, but I'm going to blow up. This is a, a, a proposition, um, and it starts out with these whereases, and I'm going to show you those whereases. And so they said, uh, the town of Madison commits to five principles, the five principles of outdoor lighting as outlined by IDA. Whereas light pollution is defined by IDA, so on and so forth. Whereas light pollution can negatively influence natural ecosystems. Whereas light pollution can disrupt migration patterns. And the whereas is just laying out the fact that Madison cares about this issue. And, um, and down at the, the bottom whereas, the city of Madison is committed to fostering environmental, economic, and social resilience and created the Madison Sustainability Plan in 2011. They point back and pat themselves on the back. Madison has already done some good things that impact lighting. The next page continues with a couple of more whereases. And they say, then, now, therefore, be it resolved that Madison commits to the five principles. And they lay out what the five principles that IDA says are. And then they say, be it further resolved that the city of Madison will apply for designation as an IDA dark sky community. That was July of last year. This was a proposal before the Common Council. Um, there it is again in its entirety. You can find that on the web. And then you really have to look for this because Madison is a bureaucracy. So this legislative information center is really hard to find. But if you find it, this shows what the Common Council's actions were uh, subsequent to that July thing. And, and, and in July 12th of 2022, the Common Council voted on this resolution. And it was adopted unanimously. Now, coverage at the time, newspaper coverage in July of 2022, showed that there were two council members out of 18, two voted against it. And those two were interviewed. And the reasons that two voted against it weren't because they objected to dark skies. They weren't because they objected to smart lighting. They were worried about costs. They were worried about, you know, how's all this going to be paid for? But it passed 16 to 2. So Madison Common Council has adopted a resolution committing them to applying for international dark sky status. So could this happen to Madison? It could. Technically speaking, the only thing the Common Council voted to do was to apply. The application process involves taking a lot of those steps that I talked to you and writing a check for $250. So technically speaking, if the city of Madison sends in that application with a $250 check, they have fulfilled that resolution. I like to believe that they're going to actually make an attempt to do this. I have been in contact 
with the city of Madison, the mayor's office, and um, city administrators. And in the meetings where this has been discussed, as that five-page list of requirements is, is detailed, I saw Madison administrators' jaws slowly drop open as they realized, wow, we have to do what? I mean, these are people who are already overworked and underpaid, and the idea of taking on something like this must seem daunting, but I believe that Madison is committed to at least making a game stab at this. Could a community with more than half a million people be a dark sky community when Flagstaff is currently the biggest one? I have some doubts that we can accomplish this, but I believe that along the way, we're gonna get some really good lighting ordinances out of this. So even if Madison can't do it, Madison will still benefit. And I use two examples. Pittsburgh, this is just an article from a couple of weeks ago, June 6. Pittsburgh is finally taking its first step toward LED streetlights, replacing 44,000 inefficient high pressure sodium lights with LED lights. And these will be LED lights that are fully shielded and that are um, going to use a lot less energy. And they are going to have illumination levels that are much more tuned to what's needed rather than more is better, brighter is better. Pittsburgh. If Pittsburgh can do this, Madison can do it. By the way, Madison has already replaced most of its streetlights. Most of our streetlights are LED. Not all of them. There's still conspicuous areas that need attention, but Madison has made big gains. And then the last city that I'll point to is Tucson. Tucson is a huge metropolitan area, but like Flagstaff, Tucson has been working on dark sky efforts for decades because Tucson is right in the middle of Kitt Peak Observatory, Mount Lemmon Observatory, Mount Graham. Um, literally, it's ringed by observatories. In the 1980s, Tucson rep recognized that astronomical tourism could be an important part of its economy, and, and Tucson has made an effort. For the past two winters, I've lived in Tucson. I've been uh, a resident of Tucson for months, and I know that Tucson has made a difference just from the neighborhoods that I've lived in. Uh, Tucson actually has data. They have really good data, and they can demonstrate with satellite imagery and, and night sky metering uh, data that's been gathered over the years that their retrofit with LEDs, they have, they have reduced Tucson's light footprint by about 13% over the decades since the 1990s and 2000s. Tucson streetlights, they do have streetlights, LED streetlights, but those streetlights come on at dusk, and at 11 p.m., those streetlights automatically dim to about 60% illumination, and many of them then go off at midnight. So the light's on when we need it, but it's off when we're not using it, or dimmed when we're not using it. If Tucson can do it, Madison can do it. Now, Tucson and Pittsburgh are not going to be international dark sky communities. They're not going for that. They're just trying to do the right thing. Madison can do the right thing too, and maybe, possibly, become the biggest international dark sky community along the way. What can we do? What can you do? First, you can change a light bulb in your own backyard. Maybe your garage lights. Maybe you've got fixtures that aren't shielded. They could be better shielded. You can do your own home. You can talk to your landlord or your neighbors about making changes that you're not empowered to make yourself. Use motion detectors, timers, and smart bulbs to limit negative effects. Join the IDA. Join the Madison Astronomical Society. Contact your town or jurisdiction about a bad street light that you think something should be done about. Contact a local business about their parking lots. Um, become an activist. Join Madison Dark Skies. Um, Madison Dark Skies is a group that I run. Right now, Madison Dark Skies is just me. And what we do, what I do, is I notify people when there are opportunities to talk to the city of Madison. So if Madison is going to have a listening session in September, and they're going to take public comment on topics that affect lighting, I'll let you know. Because maybe you'll go. And maybe you'll get up to the microphone and say, hey, dark skies are important to me. And tell them why. Because you're concerned about turtles or birds or stars. So Madison Dark Skies, oh, and social media likes, don't do it. You know, clicking like on Facebook isn't, isn't enough. Madison Dark Skies 
is a mailing list that I run. And I promise there's no newsletter, there's no fundraising, there's no nonsense. The only thing this mailing list does is notifies you when Madison is having a listening session. Or maybe Verona is, is making a proposal. Or maybe Fitchburg, because both Verona and Fitchburg are on this train. They're doing things. Um, so Madison Dark Skies is a way you can hear when there's an opportunity, or when I think something is happening legislatively, and it's time to send those emails to your alders or to your representatives. I'll let you know. So the references, um, I relied heavily on a publication of the IDA called The State of the Science 2022, just published last year. This is a 18-page uh, report that really goes into the details, a very detailed review of the literature. What does the scientific literature say about artificial light at night? What does the scientific literature say about the connection between crime and lights? That happens in my neighborhood all the time, that conversation. One of the most persistent misconceptions is that more light means my neighborhood will be safer. It's not necessarily true, but it's a very difficult misconception to undo. This can help you learn what the science says. It's available uh, on the web, summarizes more than 300 peer-reviewed studies. It's easy to, easy to find. There's the link, but again, just use Google creatively and you can find it very quickly. And that's the Fauci source that I told you about earlier, a really good uh, study published in the journal called, what's it called? Science Advances, Science Advances yeah. Uh, not one that I was familiar with, but this is, uh, Fauci is a guy who's done quite a bit of research. He's Italian, um, and he's, uh, some of his collaborators evidently are also, but he's done quite a bit of research and writing on, on the topic. And finally, the dark sky map that I use, those maps with the color overlays, that map is actually, was developed by a guy right here in Madison, a UW-Madison um, researcher uh, at Space Sciences and Engineering uh, named David Lorenz. And we actually had Dave give a talk to the Madison Astronomical Society last year. His talk is on our, our YouTube page. But that, uh, that map technology basically is, is the result of his work. And so uh, that's a really good way to find dark places and a really good way to keep track of the changes over years of, of those dark places. So Dave Lorenzo's stuff. Um, so that's it. Thank you.